Hey, Maggie. Hey, what? What would you eat while watching a scary movie? I don't know. What? Ice cream. I know it. I messed it up right <laughs>
you know, games are a great way to engage with children. Um, specifically, it's a great way to reach out to them to understand what they're talking about. And not everyone necessarily needs to be a pro gamer to be able to understand what they're saying. Um, the way I look at it is sometimes if you hear kids kind of, you know, gaggle kids walking through a mall or something, it might seem like they're speaking a foreign language. You don't know what they're saying. Um, even a cursory level of familiarity with some of the games that are popular will mean that you might be able to identify that they're talking about Pokemon as opposed to Call of Duty. And it, believe it or not, it's hard to tell that apart. My wife struggles sometimes um, until we ran this. Linda struggled with this um, until I gave her some, uh, some tips. So um, it, I, I, that's really why I'm here, is to talk about just the value of familiarizing yourself and also because they can be useful. Um, so. I sped through most of these without clicking slides, but we've been around for about five years. We cover video games and board games. I know this is a technology class, so obviously that's going to be important, but Linda is my board game editor, so she's going to at least touch on some of those things because they tend to be more easily used in a classroom setting. Um, and, you know, that's our slogan. We're, we, I try to be clever, uh, the get your family game on thing. It, who knows? Um, I like it. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So, um, just a brief introduction for myself. Um, I'm the founder of the website. Um, I've been gaming my entire life. So I was born in 1980, so we can all do the math on that. Um, I've had a controller in my hand for as long as I can remember. Um, it's a super important part of my life. I identify myself as a gamer when people ask me. Um, brief show of hands, does anyone in this room identify themselves as a gamer? Fair enough. Judgment-free zone, listen, uh, I put several thousand hours into World of Warcraft, so um, how many people who didn't raise their hand have Candy Crush on their phone? Um, okay. Uh, okay. So, how about a parent of gamers? Uh, listen. A parent of gamers, because they're in college. I'll throw my hands up in the air, I'm, I'm yeah, a parent of gamers too. parents of gamers, because I know all those games, and I know what they're instructing. Okay. So I'm like, you know, are you going to add that category in I'm, there? I'm, I'm, listen, we can. Uh, there's all sorts of buckets we can put people in. I was born before you. All right. Well, so that's fair. I'm, I'm older than you. There's a few people that, that there. My understanding is that there are a few people on Earth that were born before I was. So, um, and you know what? Um, the fact that you. So there's a few people that have Candy Crush on their phone. I want to kind of touch on that. According to statistics according to the video game lobbying board, which is the ESA, you are a gamer, you are considered one. Um, and part of that is because games are an inescapable part of our lives. Frankly, when you go to McDonald's and you play that little Monopoly game where you, you eat too much McDonald's and you get the Monopoly things and nobody wins anything, I don't care, no one wins anything, but we all play it, that's a game. <laughs> um, is it a great game? Probably not, but we all play it. Um, and so, we're all gamers. It's, a, it's just, it, it, it's, it's an inescapable part of modern life. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to fight it. You know, we don't have to call ourselves gamers and, you know, you don't have to wear a World of Warcraft t-shirt to do it. Um, can, so, can I throw in one category? Of course you can. Minutes? By the way, interrupt me whenever you like. I just would like to add to the Of course. We've been asked to add to the conversation, to build up the conversation. Do it. Um, another category I'd like to add is we went to the sports games because when he was involved, the older one, he's 20 now, I told them, I don't think this is a good idea. I think you need to get into Madden and sure. know, whatever, blah, blah, basketball. Sure. So those were the ones that we, you know, and then he'd go back to and say, oh, another one was released or something. But then, and then it petered out as they got older, uh, as they hit. And all that. Sport, I mean, sports games, there's a reason that there's an entire, I mean, Electronic Arts is, that they're a billion dollar company, and there's a reason for that, yeah, because they NFL, just, the they make NFL, NBA, FIFA, they actually make more money off their soccer games, because of international audiences, FIFA makes so much money. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a reason they exist, that's the reason they're a billion dollar company, it's because they make those games over and over again, and man, do people keep buying them. Um, I'm terrible at them, that's the only reason I don't buy them. Um, because I just, you know, I can only be bad at so many things. Um, so this is Linda. Linda, why don't you introduce yourself sure. um, before I move on to other slides. Okay, so I'm Linda Robel. I am the board game editor for Engage Family Gaming. I've been uh, covering games for about a year and a half at this point, just over that. 
Um, but my day job is I am a first grade teacher. I've been doing that for 17 years. I've been teaching for 18. And I have two kids at home. And I kind of got into gaming backwards. So Steve talks about being, you know, like always having a controller in his hand. I blame him for dragging me into the gaming world, kicking and screaming about. I want to be clear. She really wasn't kicking and screaming. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe when I wasn't paying attention. So, but he actually got me into LARPing in 2003, so a couple of years ago now. And so that's live action role play. So you know, dressing up as a character and really getting. You, you had to do that now. You had to out us that now. We're five minutes into the presentation. Thank you. Full disclosure: We are nerds of nerds. Um, but it went backwards from there, so I start with this high-level geeky nerding, running around in costume and having a grand old time, went to D&D, the tabletop, you know, rolling dice and all that, and then got into board games. So completely went into it backwards. It is super backwards. Super backwards, so, you know. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I can't believe it's only been about a year and a half covering games, because I've very much gone down the rabbit hole with the board game uh, enjoyment, and a little bit with the video games. I'm definitely not the video gamer. But I keep in the loop because of my students, because of my two children at home. Um, just being knowledgeable about it is so valuable. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that, there's so much to know out there that's such a big industry. So. Thank you. Um, I forgot to, to, I completely forgot to talk about my kids. So I'll do that real fast. <laughs> um, I have three children, 12, 10, and 5. Um, they they were born with controllers in their hands, um, and they partic they participate, you know, when their homework is done, um, and it's important to them. Um, and the reason I continue doing the work that I do, a lot of it is because I, I, I want to keep finding good stuff for them to play, because otherwise I get lost. <coughs> there's a lot of excuse me, there's a lot of noise, right? I mean, we see it on the news and things like that. Being aware means that there always there's always something for them to do that I think is appropriate, age appropriate, challenging, and interesting. Um, and I can share it with them, which I think is important. So um, I guess the, you guys were asked to define what is gaming. Um, I took it a little bit in a different direction. Um, I, defined, I wanted to define what is a game. So does anyone have a rough guess of a definition of what a game is? Don't worry, I have some answers, so it's cool if we can't come up with one from the class. Anybody? Yeah, so something that has a, a goal, rules, and maybe some obstacles. Either you know your stuff or you read this board real fast. So good job. You're right. Those are some key components. Anybody else? I thought it was the purpose was to have fun with your family or your friends. Fun? I certainly that a was the main purpose of the game. <laughs> um, fun is certainly a component. Although some people would argue that fun doesn't necessarily need to be involved, there are some game-like activities that are not necessarily fun. Um, but I, I disagree with that definition. But um, I've got, I brought some definitions for the class, um, and it's that I think they're kind of interesting. My favorite is from Sid Meier. Sid Meier is a famous game designer. He's responsible for Civilization, um, and also uh, a game called Pirates, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, he's a pioneer in the game design space. Uh, he defines a game as a series of meaningful choices. Um, and that's my favorite definition um, because it applies both to the electronic space but also to the board game space. I mean, we are, every time you are playing a game, even if you're thinking about the most basic stuff, right? You're playing Super Mario Brothers. When do you jump? When do you, what, when, how do you explore and find those secrets, etc.? We might. There might be some extra steps along the way, manual dexterity, you know, being able to hit the button at the right time, etc. But at the end of the day, when do I jump? Where do I go? How fast do I run? Those are meaningful choices. If you go too slow, you run out of time, you die. You jump at the wrong time, etc., etc. So that's my personal favorite definition. However, there are a few more that are pretty good. Jesse Shell, uh, who is way smarter than me. Um, is uh, describe them as a game is a problem solving activity approached with a playful attitude. That's kind of where that fun comes in, right? You know, so games are problems. They are things that need to be solved, right? I hesitate to call them puzzles because not all of them necessarily involve that. You know, puzzles kind of carry some extra baggage with them, but um, it's a problem solving activity. And the idea is play. You know, we talked about fun in the back of the room, but that's the goal. But before you get to the fun, it's the idea that it's for play. This is not life or death stuff, right? 
Um, I try to, when I'm playing games with people and they're getting stressed out because they don't know what to do, it's like, we're not playing for money here. I mean, maybe, sometimes I guess maybe people are, but that's a different animal. But we're not playing for money here. Let's just enjoy ourselves and play. Um, some other definitions. Um, Eric Zimmerman and Kate Salen uh, said that a game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules and with a quantifiable outcome. I like the quantifiable outcome piece because every game has to have an end state. We talk about you know, wanting to win. Um, sometimes it, 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 there's always a way to tell. Is the game over? Um, you know, we think about you know, games like the NFL. You know when the game is over, the clock runs to zero, et cetera. Um, so that's another definition. The last one is it is a structured experience with rules and goals that is fun. I'm glad the two of you kind of brought this definition together. Um, that's from Amy Jo Kim, another famous uh, game designer. So I, you gave them homework. I thought I would take the homework too um, and do my piece. I just totally did the wrong assignment. That's why I didn't do well in college. Um, so um, what questions do you guys have for me? Do these make you think? Are they interesting? Do you disagree with any of them? I, it's totally fine with me. Y'all are, I, listen, I'm the dumbest man in the room, so the go ahead. The part I would add would be like strategy. Sure. I mean, that's meaningful choices, but usually like a game, there's some sort of strategy mm -hmm. sure. to achieving whatever the goal is. Absolutely, I, I agree with that. I think that's kind of buried somewhere in most of these decisions, but I agree with you completely. You have to have a plan. That's one of the reasons why games are so great, is that you can't, I mean, you can, but you can't, it's not easy to succeed in a game without having a plan. It might be a bad plan, but you have to make a plan up. And, you know, everybody, I don't know if you guys have heard that quote, like everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Mike Tyson made that quote. And quoting Mike Tyson, probably not the best thing to do in this university, but we'll do the best I can. Um, it's, but it's true, right? You have to make a plan, and then something's going to go wrong, and you have to be able to think on the fly. It's one thing that my kids are great at it because they've been playing games for so long. I think that's something that a lot of kids that have been playing games for as long as they have, it helps them because they, you, you have to experiment. You die, you got to try something new. Um, and games allow you to do that in an instant. Um, whereas you can't necessarily do that on a test, you know. Um, so we do have, this is Linda, she did the homework correctly. She found a, a definition for gaming and gamification. Why don't you go, Linda? Sure. So um, to... I, was, I heard about the assignment as well. Um, so we went through, and I looked at some different definitions. I went more to like Webster, Mary Webster and such. Because um, she's super literal, guys. I'm, That's what she's getting. Because I'm the first, first grade teacher, first grade teacher yeah. <laughs> the educator, so I went to the, the standard and tried to pull some things from some of those sources, too. So it might have a very different flavor. But what I came up with, um, gaming is the act of playing regardless of the format. So there's so many formats, and we're gonna to touch on a lot of them tonight, between electronic formats and tabletop formats. And then the gamification, and this is where it comes into the classroom a lot, is taking those game elements and applying them in to a non-gaming format. So I heard that there was a question about Go Noodle, and if that was considered gaming. So I thought, my first instinct, well, not really, and I'm like, well, no, you have points. Because that's a huge thing. My class uses Go Noodle every day. And that's something that I also look at the math because it's 10 points. We're at three. How many more till we get to 10? Who is a first grade teacher? And so, but it's a game. There's points. And on some of the, some of the activities you have with the answer questions. It depends on which setting you pick. So some of them are just relaxing ones. Some are get up and dance. But it's like, well, yeah, there is some gamification to it. Is it all gamification? Maybe, maybe not, you can argue the case. But that really got me thinking and like, okay, we have a lot of gamification in the classroom we may not even realize. So any other things you can think of that are gamification that we use? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us sure. what a non-gaming format is? Mm -hmm. What's an example of that? Oh, I mean, an example so, of a... Something that's non-gaming? Yeah, so specifically, you know, I talked about the Monopoly thing. Right, like that's not. It's a game, but it's not really. Um, but uh, you know, let me let me correct myself. Um, airline points, right? You, you you fly, you earn the points, you get the miles, etc. Technically, you're making a decision. You're flying. You're using them. 
and then you are that they are encouraging you to collect these points so that you can go on a vacation or so you can use those points for other things. Maybe you get into a better lounge. That is an example of commercial gamification that is that doesn't really have a game-like element because you, to a degree, you don't really have much of a decision, right? Like you, you have to fly, presumably. Um, so that's that's an example of commercial gamification and that's a place, that that's everywhere. Um, most companies, if they haven't already implemented some type of thing to try and encourage us through points and whatnot to, um, per, you know, to participate and engage with their product, they're working on it. Another really good one is Facebook. Facebook is a hundred percent a game. There's a score. You have a certain friends. You have people liking your posts. Um, we may not all be playing the same game, right? You know, not everybody is competing, quote unquote, to have the most friends or to get the most likes on their posts, but. It is 100% a game. There are quantifiable goals. There are things that they tell you, and that's not a game, but it, 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 there's gamification. There's game-like elements in that, um, and that's true with just about all social media, Instagram, things like that. I know because I'm stuck in that game. <laughs> Fitbit. Fitbit, man, listen, Fitbit's a Tamagotchi, but you're the dumb critter that you're trying to keep alive, right? <laughs> and um, you can't reset it. And you make can't it reset again. it. You can, I mean, it's it, not yet. Give it, a, give it a good 30, 40 years, you'd probably be able to reset it. What, um, what would be an example, though, in the classroom of a non gaming yeah. format? Math. What? Math. Here's a worksheet that's got some blanks in it. You have to roll the dice to put the numbers in. That's one of my centers this week. There's three blanks. Get a six-sided die. Roll it three times. Write those numbers. Add them. I made it. It's like a game now. I took a basic arithmetic practice. And I we're, we're in a high school level. We're not okay. Yeah. And we're scientists. Trying, and, uh, well, I'm no, so I'm trying to understand. So, how can we apply the science? So, so um, that's a great question. I, I come from the elementary yeah, perspective as well. It's not science. It's all, I mean, I use, you know, life it's, skills. So, really, when we're thinking about a non gaming format, we're thinking of anything, you're not taking uh, something that's marketed as a game, advertised as a game, either through a technological device or a board game but you're allowing students to grapple with what we call soft skills. So those 21st century skills, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, strategizing, what we would call an executive function skill, planning, prioritization, organization, anything that is a non-gaming format, it's not marketed or advertised as a game. Hey, boys and girls, we're playing a game here but it's allowing them to use some of those discrete skills. The competitiveness, the problem you solving, got the strategies. You that's gamification. Okay. Oh, okay. In oh, education. the content area? You got it. Oh, it doesn't matter. You got it. It be anything. Like, like when they have like, um, you have to protect the egg and you've got to build some kind of structure, apparatus and then, around right, it. Right, and then depending on how high, so it's a game, right? If somebody, you know, from the different levels, if they drop it, maybe right. and the egg is, you right. know, so you take the gravity thing in science class right. where you're showing the force, force, who does, oh, who does, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. Like yeah. that, like getting that competitive yeah. element, yeah. Great. how high can you drop it from? There's some, there's some other slides later on that we might, where we might get it, where we might dig into things that we, that we can pull more out of. And maybe we can have a more detailed discussion later on. Not that I want to rush us, but no, awesome. I think we can answer that question kind of sideways and then we can, we can tackle it later. Because I can understand what you're saying. Some of the stuff, I'm, I get what you're saying. Again, I'm the dumbest dude in the room, so forget No, it. it's, it's a tackling um, question. You're the so, expert right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate that. So, um, Linda, the next slide is also yours. We did this thing where we created the, it was, it was like a group project, right? Like we both worked on it. Um, I, you know, so Linda was fortunately the good student. Um, so Linda, you're, this is your slide. Okay. So I'll just sit there. All back right, and so quiet. this touches on a little bit of what we just were talking about with the gamification, but why use games with the students? Why bring in this the games or gamification into the classroom? Mm -hmm. um, engagement's a big one. It makes it more fun. It gives, it's, instead of just standing up and lecturing, if they have to go investigate for that. Um, it encourages them to do problem solving. It encourages the flexible thinking. You end up with, a lot of times you end up having that the students have to collaborate to get that student discourse. And with that, it goes back, that ties back into problem solving with the people skills. I have a strong idea. The other person has a strong idea. Their, our ideas are different. Now we have to work it out. So you've got that collaboration, but also learning how to work together. Um, a lot of times, there's a lot of games out there that involve ste the steam. 
So sometimes it's the arts involved. So I throw the A in there because we hear a lot about STEM, but there's things out there that have the arts tied in. I actually brought a game that I'll show you later that has a digital component, has a card feature, and it's got music of all things. So it's really neat. Yeah, so definitely got, has that um, piece. And a lot of times with the games, it's that visible progress. So one thing that my students like using, my remedial students, is a program called Lexia. So for my language arts, my students who are cha having challenges in language arts, it is a really focused program. They go in, they log in, it tracks the progress, and it discreetly practices language arts skills. It is all games. They have to build this thing, and then this cute cracker pops up, and you know they get to do this thing. And these boring, discreet, really basic literacy skills they now want to go log in and do this practice because it's all in a game format. They have to build, you know, it's dragging the word piece over to finish building the word and the right vowel pair or whatever skill they're working on. But because of the format, it's gamification with it. It's keeping track of points. They get to see their progress. It, they, are, they buy in so much on it. So something as simple as that, you know, building the discrete language art skills using that game, now they're engaged and they're, they want to do it, they want to practice. Yes? Is it free? Unfortunately, the district buys that one. Um, usually the best ones are not free. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch, um, if, if the resource is available, I highly recommend that for districts to buy because it, it, it tracks them, it does such a great job, it prints out lessons, you know, you have lessons and tons of data, but you're paying for that service. Yeah. And I, it's not, it's What's not. What's it called again? Lexia. Mm -hmm. So that's a -E -X -I -A. I But there are some, certainly some free options as well. Mm -hmm. Starfall, Raz Kids. That's a um, subscription. Mm -hmm. Is it? I think right. there's features that there may be features. free. Okay. Um, Roy the Zebra. Um, we do see it's good. ABC, yeah. So there, there's definitely, um, definitely gamification in all of those yes. online and pieces. What makes them want to play? Starfall has one game that has actually Describing to Steve earlier tonight, it's arithmetic. They have to practice their math facts, and they have to complete the math fact in order for the little bridge to come down and the little guy to run across the bridge. And then he comes to another bridge, and he has to you have to complete the math fact. The bridge drops it. I mean, it's practice. When you get down to it, it's practicing math facts. But because of the game of component, that's like the first thing they want to go to. When I let them go on Starfall, like half the class is logged into that one game and they're practicing math. So. It's I'm, got a nice place. I'm not ashamed to admit that my chi my kids use Starfall, and I have been practic I have spent some time practicing my math facts. <laughs> um, because I mean, it, 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 it that's part of the piece, right? I mean, games are engaging just by nature of the fact that you're doing it and you're participating. And maybe not for everyone, right? Not everyone is, you know, all is all in on games, but most kids are now. The statistics are showing it, so it's a way to grab them. It's a Trojan horse. I mean, just sneak that learning right on in there. Mm -hmm. um, which is uh, brings us to our next slide to so just talk about because um, you know we talked about you know she talked about Starfall and some other you know games that are specifically um, the term that gets thrown around commercially is like edutainment. Um, it gets a bad rap um, to the point where they kind of stopped making it um, and they kind of limited it to like these free online services. Like you used to be able to buy like learning games for your Nintendo. Like that's not a thing anymore so much now. It's kind of limited to phones and uh, you know, iPads and to PC platforms. However, um, there are a lot of other video games where the learning is just kind of there. You just have to coax it out. Um, I thought we would bring up some very high level examples. Um, you know, we talk about science. Um, you know, we have some science teachers in the room. Um, Minecraft, has, before I just glance over it, does anyone not know what Minecraft is? All right, let's do it. Um, I love talking about Minecraft. So Minecraft is more or less Legos. Um, it was, um, if you haven't encountered it, I would recommend spend five minutes on YouTube at some point. Google Minecraft, take a look at what the game actually entails. For the most part, it's a game uh, where you explore a world built of uh, voxels, which are basically just cubes. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different ways to play um, because they, the designers realize that people want to engage with their product in a whole bunch of different ways. There's a creative mode where you can just build Legos and do whatever you want. Um, but they also have like, you know, survival mode where you have to mine for ore and go fishing and raise plants. And it's got a really interesting, you know, survival piece to it. 
Um, but the game actually uses like a real consistent physics engine. So when you jump and jump into water, it's using what real world would happen if you were to jump into water. It's not a good idea to jump from really high distances, spoilers. Um, so um, it, it, Minecraft is a, and also all the blocks are the same size. Everything is the same size, um, which means um, you can use it for, you know, measurements and, you know, you shoot an arrow out of a bow and arrow. You can kind of measure how far the arrow went, things like that. It gives you really interesting ways to use that tool set. Um, and there is actually um, a, there's a Minecraft Learning Edition, I think is the name of it, um, or Minecraft Student Edition, one of those two. Student or Learning is attached to it. Um, and it is, it includes a whole bunch of set of tools where if you were to choose, a teacher could create their own place where only their students could go in and you can set up experiments and make them do experiments in that virtual classroom. Um, that's not attractive to everybody, but the reality is there, uh, last month they reported that there were 91 million World of War, uh, not World of Warcraft, that's a different game. 91 million, I got it on my head now. 91 million Minecraft players last month. And this game came out uh, eight, nine years ago. Um, Everybody says Fortnite's the biggest game in the world, and it's not. Minecraft it eats its lunch every day, um, and quietly so. Um, and part of that's because it's you know you're creating your own worlds, and you don't necessarily have to play the same game every time. So kids really eat it up. Um, my oldest son is 12. My uh, my youngest son is 10. My 10 year old loves him some Fortnite. And he plays that, and we can talk about that later. That doesn't really have any learning applications. But my older son. You would turn that off and he would play Minecraft for hours because he loves to just build things, build houses. You can learn coding in there. They actually have things where you can do if-then statements and you can build it. I saw someone build a calculator in Minecraft. They had way more time on their hands than I do, but they did. Um, so some other things. There are an almost infinite number of online platforms that are gamified where you can learn coding specifically. One of them um, and we put it on here because my sons use it, and I'm pretty sure your son has. If he has it, he will in a week. Um, and it's called Scratch. Um, it has its own proprietary coding language, and they can make their own games. And not only can they make their own games, they can publish their own games. Meaning, they can just, if they have an idea, they can make it, and they can publish it and share it with their friends. Um, my oldest son has started the process. He's made it halfway through development and kind of petered out, but he wants to make games and he wants me to publish them on my website and I could totally do it. Um, because, and they're even working on ways where you can export them and have them turned into phone apps so people can play them on their iPhones, which is crazy, giving kids the free tools to create their own games. Um, and we all know coding is important, but not just for the act of coding, you know, it gives you that logical thinking. Um, so the bottom two, little, little, uh, obtuse, but we'll go there. One of them is called Nintendo Labo. Has anybody heard of that? No. We got one, okay. two. Nice. So okay. the picture here is of my younger son. He's holling one of the pieces built from one of the it's, Nintendo Labo kits. I wish I had brought one. Yeah. So we, I mean, Nintendo, they're a game company. They make toys, more or less. Um, and they put out this line of video game adjacent products, where it's essentially a box of pre-punched pre-printed cardboard where you actually punch out the cardboard and you build your own game peripherals. So my five-year-old built a piano that works. Um, and the way that it works is the, the new Nintendo, the Switch, and you can Google all this and see videos, it's fascinating stuff, um, has a, a IR sensor on one of the controllers. And so you actually stick the, it, I freaked out when I saw this working. I didn't believe it was gonna happen. So you stick it in the back of the piano and the piano keys are all attached to a little arm that has reflective tape on it. So the IR camera notices the reflective tape, and so it's, you know, depending on the position of the, you know, the, the little arm that's moving, it knows what note to play. So my five-year-old built a piano out of cardboard and then played Happy Birthday for my sister-in-law the other day, which is, mind-blowing and they have another one where you I built a robot suit for myself and I transformed and for a guy that was born in 1980 being able to transform into something is like life goals yeah. um, so what Eli's holding in this picture is basically an RC car so there's no wheels on it but because the what they're called the the red and the blue things you see on the side those are the joy cons those are basically the controllers they, or vibrate. The they vibrate 
So using the using a, another a, the switch itself, the, you can actually control them, and it will vibrate along the table, and it will like really a little go bug. forward, sure. like the hex. It's super you know, fascinating. Um, and, and he built that one. That was the easiest one, one of the smaller pieces. So five years old, he built that with minimal support. And the, I mean, you can see the grin. He just was so proud. Well, and, and it also gives them, you know, the instructions. You know, it gives them. You know, they, they actually step. learn how it works, and they talk about why it functions. The last one I mentioned, just because it surprised me when it happened. Assassin's Creed is a, an M-rated video game that is all about history. Um, and I've always wondered myself why they spend millions of dollars creating these historical worlds um, and you can't do anything other than murder people in them. And obviously that's not appropriate for children, but what they did is they actually created a mode where they strip out all of the game elements and you can just walk around in this beautifully rendered 3D world. Uh, last year it was Egypt, and so it was this beautifully rendered Egypt, and they actually hired museum uh, you know, tour guides, and you can just walk around this beautifully rendered place um, and get a get a uh, get a tour of the pyramids and mummification and stuff like that. And this year's was uh, ancient Greece. And they're doing the same thing. Um, obviously, it takes them a little extra time, um, but super fascinating stuff. And the good news is, all that stuff is on YouTube. So if you're interested, or if your students are interested, they can just watch the tours on YouTube. And if they're not on YouTube yet, I'm going to put them there so you can just <laughs> find my stuff. Um, so those are you know, some examples of ways that you can take games that are out of the box, not necessarily for learning, and you just kind of sneak it in there. Um, next page. This is Linda's slide. Or is this my slide? No, this is your slide. No? You go. We collaborate. We, there's a lot of collaboration. So we're going to delve deeper into these. We actually have a slide for each of these components. But there's a lot of discussion about the perils of screens for kids. And we all have heard the perils. So we wanted to present you some of the benefits that will come with some of these technology pieces. Um, one of the big ones is learning digital citizenship. We are in a digital age. Regardless of what we do to shelter our kids, the day will come when the parental controls are turned off and they are out in the wild in the interweb. And we, they need to know how to handle themselves. Just like we teach them how to handle walking across you know, the street, we teach them how to walk down, you know, if you're in an area that you can walk, like to the grocery store, you know, how you walk in public and be safe. How can you navigate the internet and be safe and responsible? So Steve's going to talk more about that briefly, but let me just hit the bullet points super fast and then we'll go into kind of a delving deeper into each of these. One big term we've been hearing lately in education is productive struggle. You don't want to just hand them the answers. They need to know how to get there and how to figure it out. Well, a lot of these games, you don't get to the end point the first shot. A lot of times it takes multiple tries, multiple strategies. So that's something that we'll talk a little more about um, cooperation with things that are collaborative. Some games are solo, some games are collaborative, and in that you need to work on the cooperation and the teamwork. And then tangential learning, this is actually with uh, Steve's specialty, so he'll delve more into that, but where you go when you're interested in a topic, how you can kind of snake to the next topic, to the next, and go from there, and other things you can learn from it. So, you want to jump right to the digital citizenship slide? Yeah. We can delve deeper into that? Yeah, sure. Because I know you could speak quite eloquently. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is probably one of my biggest, you know, I could probably write a book about it. I probably should write a book about it. <laughs> um, so, the, the reason we bring some of these things up is not necessarily because we think that you guys need to be sold on the value of screens and, you know, technology and games, um, uh, because you probably would have stormed out of the classroom if, if we had to, um, <laughs> but because the, and this is something that I'm not even an educator, um, but I still, am, you know, I speak at libraries and I, you know, I go to places and I'm confronted regularly. I was on an airplane and I couldn't escape. I was on a tube a mile above the sky with a guy telling me that I was the devil. It was very challenging, but um, some of these things are, you know, talking about the benefits of some of these games um, are important. Um, and that just having some of this knowledge will, should help um, kind of deal with some of those objections. Um, and the big piece is digital citizenship. Um, I could go on forever, but I'll make it relatively simple. Um, you know, students, they, they need skills in order to be active members of their communities and to make smart choices online and in life. Now, I know that not everyone here is going to be responsible for teaching 
younger people, um, but as we all know, just from hearing things, it's not just young people that make mistakes online. Um, these are, a lot of these games are, you know, it, it's, it, it, a lot of the games are collaborative, and a lot of them involve interacting in an online space, and that's not going away. Um, our world is shrinking, and a lot of that is because we all live on the internet. Um, uh, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of literature out there about like digital natives, right? Like these kids, they know everything. You know, they, we talk about nightmares about two-year-olds that can use iPhones. Um, I don't think that's a nightmare. I think it's fascinating. But the idea that they're living in these digital worlds, and by it, we we got to encourage it, and we just got to have to we have to teach them. Um, and some of these games, like you know, online games and things like that, um, you know, I let my kids do that, and I encourage other people to do the same because they got to learn um, and participate in it. Um, and I'm sure that as you start using digital products like this in your classroom, you're going to have some parents that are going to be like, "Listen, my kid doesn't get to use a screen ever." Um, and I don't know how your pot. Obviously, your school's law have policies on that, but it, the the idea that they live in a digital world, and avoiding it is of not really much value um, because they, you're robbing them of skills. Um, so that that's my thought on that. Um, you know, the, these games, a lot of them, they give you the tools that you need. Um, and so, yeah, I could go on forever, and we'll talk after the class if you really want to. But that's the digital citizenship piece. Is that you, you want to be a good part of, of society. And the reality is, if you're if you can't interact with it because you don't know how, you can't. So, it was a little rambly, and I apologize for that. Um, Any questions yeah. on that before we move on? Nope. No? All right. You can do the production. Right, you're going to be way more uh, articulate than I am. I hope so. Um, so, productive struggle is a term that's come up in education fairly recently, where we want them to develop these habits so they persevere, so they don't just give up. I don't know how to do it, you need to help me. And trying to get them to think be flexible with what they're doing, try different ways. So if it doesn't work the first time, it's okay, try again. And that it's okay not to know what to do at the beginning. Kind of giving them permission to struggle. And I think there's been a long time where we've sheltered them a little too much, and we just wanted to help them, we didn't want them getting frustrated. And it does them a disservice, because you need to be able to problem solve. We're not always handed the answers in life. You've got to figure it out, and it's not always easy. So, you know, on a lot of things within games, just like in life, you've got to work your way through. Most, a lot of video games that I, I don't play generally, but I watch, a lot of video games, they throw you in. Feet first, you have to start figuring it out, and so your character has to restart. That's okay, you just try again. And so they experience that in a safe way that there's no permanent consequences. At the very worst, you delete the safe game, you start all over. So they can try it in a safe environment where nobody's getting hurt for real. So this is just one of those formats where it just gives them a safe place. And I know we make our classrooms safe for them to, to try things. We encourage them to make mistakes. But this is even less threatening because it's not even them anymore. It's the character. It's the little icon on the screen. You know, little Mario jumping around. Oh, he fell off the world. Okay, he's going to try again. Get back over here. Try to make, make it down the path. Or playing the old Mario Kart, I would always fall off the fall off the world. Yeah, you did. I'm terrible. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, and my kids can see me struggle with something. That's the other thing too. If you play with the kids, and they're better than you, oh, the confidence. My now six year old that you saw the beautiful picture of. Um, there's a game on our Switch, uh, Super Mario Odyssey. You may or may not have heard of. Well, he went through. He has beaten the game. Granted, we put it on assist mode, so it helped him out a little. But he beat it. Mommy couldn't finish. And that pride that he finished, and I haven't gotten through the game yet. It's, you know, there's confidence there. And he had a struggle, even having it on this assist mode. There were sections he got stuck on. And we might have coached him a little, oh, try coming over here, come back over this, let's look at the right, you know, like, use some strategies. Let's see, six. You know, we're not going to let him struggle and flounder. But he had a he had productive struggle in this game for fun. And he's learned that it's okay. So that's the mentality we're trying to encourage and, and develop in our students, is perseverance. And if I can interject Absolutely. one yeah. Sure. When we talk about the top educational trend right now, when we talk about the number one most researched topic in our field right now, it's growth mindset and productive struggle. 
So if you are currently aspiring to be in a classroom, this is something you're going to want to do some more of your own research on. Um, productive struggle and the growth mindset. Um, number one trend in, in education right now, giving students those opportunities to persevere and problem solve. And of all the trends I've seen come through, this is the one that I think they've really hit the mark on. Absolutely. This is a really, I mean, these are life skills, and we talk a lot about the 21st century skills. Problem solving and not giving up is huge. Absolutely huge. I think if I could just add on to that before we go into Q and A on it, I think the, one of the other advantages to like digital to, to games and other things like that is that it's rapid iteration, which is something that is important in like the workplace, right? Like the idea is you can fail and immediately restart. In a lot of cases, you know, failure has a cost of time, even if it's not you know you're you're not getting hurt. There's a cost of time, and a lot of game like atmospheres, restarting is as quick as resetting the pieces on the board or you know resetting a console or something like that that rapid iteration and being able to just try something and say all right let's do this and failing and saying all right that obviously didn't work let's try something else that's you know in a you know in a workforce being able to do that and kind of think flexibly um, and be willing to just give it a shot um, is huge um, so I just thought I'd throw that out there any other questions? I mean, I where I, I agree with that, mm -hmm. I also wonder too if the speed at which, you know, now with the game, oh, I, I failed, oh, I can just go back in and do it again. Like, if that's going to set any unrealistic expectations of when you do something, you know, outside of the game. And not always that easy to just start all over again. So, well, you just know, like everything, there's costs and benefits. That's the thing. This is this the perfect thing to teach them everything? Absolutely not. This is just one tool in our tool belt. You know, I mean, that's, you're right. That's not real life. I, I elbow somebody and they fall down and get hurt. I can't just hit restart. It doesn't work that way. Right. And so it's, but it's one piece. Trying things when it's when it's in an environment you can just take those risks. And that's another thing to teach them. In this environment, you can just have that. Right, I think that's what's And that's going to be part sure of it. To, to absolutely. highlight that. You're absolutely right. No, but that's that's one thing, and I don't want to make it sound like we think this is the end all be all. This is one thing. This is one tool in our tool belt. We have to have 50 more tools, because that's the way it works in education. And then we need our backup 50 tools when those don't work, because that's how life is. And all of these benefits, like a benefit to anything in our field, is always just partnered with direct explicit instruction. Absolutely. So you're going to do those think aloud strategies. You're going to give opportunities for students to grapple with that metacognition where you're talking aloud those opportunities for, okay, in this context, this is how this is working. Mm -hmm. And these are going to be some of the problems that you might face. And, and here's how we might solve them together or, or independently. Um, but again, always the guided practice and always the direct explicit instruction. And you can even contrast it with things in real life. Were you talking about the egg drop before? Yep. I mean, that's a one shot. You don't get to restart and do that again. Right, right. You right. know, maybe next year if you run that experiment again in, in the activity, but, and you know, having them understand, you get one shot at this, you sure. can plan as much as you want, you can do all these things, and making it explicit, and knowing, hey, this over here, I can try again, I can try again, I can try again, here I gotta do my absolute best the first shot, because I only got one. And I think making that distinction is, is a really critical. So we do that a lot too. We do those as explicit right. expectations. So it just pulls right in. Just what something about, else? Yeah, what about kids that they can keep trying, but they don't want to because they end up hating the fact that they keep losing? And that's where you have to balance it. That's where the instruction comes in. So that game, the program we talked about, see a book before? Mm -hmm. I've had kids that they had not mastered a skill. They just, it did not click with them and they were struggling, 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 and the program bumped them into remediation and it just did not click with that digital means. Mm -hmm. And that's where you go back and you pull them and you go old school and you pull out the manipulatives with the letters and you're building things, or you, you know, then you have to go back and do a different strategy. Mm -hmm. Because it does, again, this is what's one thing, it's not working, you've gotta pull it back and do something different. Mm -hmm. And it may not be a digital thing. You may have to go to a completely different strategy. Next slide is me, I think. Yes. Wait, really? Did we put them in the deck? 
I, I think I scramble up the slides. It's fine. Okay. So tangential learning. I'll go over this one relatively quickly because we could go over a million examples and I'm pretty sure all of you guys could come up with some once I define it. Tangential learning is basically the idea that um, if, it, well, there, I wrote a definition, or I found a definition, so I may as well use it. Uh, it's the process by which people will self-educate if a topic is exposed to them in the context that they already enjoy. Um, there's a whole bunch of examples about this, um, but you know, my son read the Percy Jackson books and got super into it, and then decided that he needed to become a master in Greek mythology. He knew everything within a few weeks, and I couldn't keep up with it. That's just one example. The idea that this is treating um, you know, something that getting kids engaged or having a student engaged with something and then just understanding that they're probably going to go down a rabbit hole, right? You found me because you stumbled across one thing um, and then you just went and you learned all about me for better or for worse. And I apologize. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is a, it's a similar thing, right? Like games are, you know, kid, I mean, kids and even adults will get grabbed by some of the most interesting stuff. So you just put, putting games in front of them if they are engaged in it, it may grab their interest. I had no idea that my son was going to decide to be this crazy, um, you know, Greek mythology expert. But he did it. He was eight. And he knew about everything. And I didn't. Maybe not everything, but you know what I mean. So um, this is another benefit to games. Because a lot of them have, it could be a word um, that is being used in, you know, just offhand by whoever the writer was. Something, and it could just be one word, and they're going to go find it, and they're going to learn and find out that it was in Hebrew, and then they're going to learn a dead language. And I mean that, and I'm not even really joking, because that, that's, these are all things. So, tangential learning, I put it in all of my talks like this because I find it fascinating. It's the idea that we're all, we all want to know more knowledge. Innately, we all want to know stuff. Um, but we're more likely to try and learn things on our own if we, are, if we find it while we're having fun at first, basically. That's it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know that was a little rambly. I'm sorry. I'm not a teacher for a reason. You guys are all way better at this than me. All right. So one thing that's in a lot of games, again, not all of them, um, but some of the online games you see a lot, in tabletop games you see this in some, some more than others, um, cooperation, working together for a common goal. And that's a really critical skill. Again, another 21st century communication and cooperation. So by having to collaborate and work together, problem solving skills get developed, critical thinking skills, peer interactions, all of those pieces are absolutely critical for our students. And by having to cooperate together on a common goal, that can also help build the classroom community. And if it's wider and it's school-wide, it can even help foster the school community. So we talked earlier about Minecraft and how you can get in there is, you know, the education mode of that or is it a different game different it's, it's the same it's the same game you just buy it a different way from my from microsoft. from microsoft clearly you can see i haven't played that specifically but i know my nieces they were in an after school program and they got to go and work in minecraft presumably the education version and so that program they're working in they all had a common goal so that teamwork within that small group they have to work together they have a common goal so within this one thing you have all the communication and cooperation that can occur. Just another component of it. And I'm more concise with my speaking. Any questions on this? Is, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, okay. okay. So there's a lot of challenges and, and with using video games and in just in general. Um, and so we thought we'd highlight some of them. Uh, some of them are probably self-evident, but we wanted to just kind of go into it. Um, but you can also enjoy the picture. It's a little, but that's my son using a virtual reality headset and tripping over it, and he almost destroyed this thousand dollar machine at a convention we went to. Uh, I don't let him use VR anymore. Um, so um, some of the challenges. One of them is obviously cost. Schools have a limited budget. Video games are expensive. We know that part. Um, you know, we asked if there were some free programs. The good news is there are a lot of free programs that you just have to dig for them. Um, the uh, another piece is accessibility. Um, you know, the, you, 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 a, a console is only one thing. A computer is, you know, the, again, it comes down to cost. Um, uh, the third 
challenges content, unfortunately, a lot of the products that are made are just not, they're not appropriate. Um, and so you have to deal with that. You know, we might really be super excited about using the Assassin's Creed history mode to show them, to show our class what ancient Greece was like. But I, and I don't know that I would be able to sell that to a school board or anything like that um, because it's got the word assassin in the title. Um, the, but I, I, those are kind of the obvious ones. Um, but familiarity is one that I think is relevant. Um, we aren't all gamers in this room. So, um, you know, like I said, sometimes you see kids walking around and sometimes this even happens to me and I write about this stuff. Um, it seems like kids are speaking a, a foreign language. We don't necessarily know what they're talking about. Um, and that is a challenge with games and because they're constantly evolving and even crazier, uh, the people that play these games invent their own language to communicate. Um, and that's been a thing forever. Um, sometimes you can't understand football players when they're talking about their game either. So, um, but that is a challenge, especially since games so rapidly change and what is the crazy new thing that everybody's talking about now might not necessarily carry over. Um, There's one other side to the familiarity too, is we can't assume every child with exposure to every game. So just because tons of kids play Minecraft and know about it, not every kid's played it. Um, you know, for a gaming family, my kids know what it is. They've played it at other people's houses. We don't do that, so they have limited familiarity with how to work within that world. So it's one of those, even though it's big and every, uh, it seems like everybody's playing it and talking about it, we can't assume that everybody has that background knowledge. And part of it is because of the cost, because of everything else. Yes? I would say you can't assume that anybody's, everybody's parents want this to be going on in the classroom Absolutely. or the school either. And that's something like the Minecraft program my nieces are in, that's a separate program they had to sign in. They have right. in. It's not the whole class doing it. It's a separate program. And so some of these things may be more suited to a club where you have to sign into it, yeah. and it's not everybody, because then the parents are opting them in. And so it, it's really gonna depend on what the needs are and what's available. And I mean, the cost is a big part. We know our budgets are tiny and shrinking constantly. Is there something else? Yeah, I mean, I have a girl and a boy in college now, but when they were growing up, they, they had completely different tastes. Mm -hmm. and, um, this was 18 years ago, so this is when it first started, when the little things were Disney. So my daughter would do the Disney things and put it in the, I forgot, the Nintendo, whatever those things are in the hand. With the cartridge? Yeah, that. And so we would go and get the upgrade of whatever mm -hmm. the Disney was that we, Lion King, mm -hmm. whatever one, right? But like I said, but this thing of Assassin's Creed and all, we never bought that ever. Right. Well, so I, there was content that we never, we never, um, oh, we had certain family rules well, that absolutely. we had, and we, we told them, yeah, they won't be this and they won't be that. And, yeah, sure. well, and, and I, I agree. Category. I mentioned that because I thought it was funny. I just wanted to ask you, so that's yeah. a preface to a question I just wanted to ask you. So according to, like in the classroom, mm -hmm. there may be a difference in, if you have a classroom of girls and boys, mm -hmm. K through 12, we're mostly secondary. Okay. But on the levels you're talking about, um, in the clubs, because I'm not in the secondary, you're in the secondary yeah. already. So are they offering the girls and the boys different menus? In other words, Mary used to like okay. Minecraft. Okay. But Abraham wasn't doing, Abraham was doing what he was doing, this guy, the war stuff, the thing. He got, <laughs> he got it all out of his system and then he did athletics and then. I can, I can speak to that. So, yeah. so yeah, I can girls speak to and that. boys, how do you handle in um, the school system? Statistically speaking, yeah. there have been a lot of studies on diversity and inclusion in the gaming space. Right. Statistically speaking, um, when, with, with the exception of um, you know, certain classes of games that we wouldn't really be thinking about using anyway, you know, like you know, hyper-violent shooters and things like that that exist, yeah, but are not. But the thi to, to, we'll put a pin in what I was saying. Just, I mentioned Assassin's Creed not to be a distraction, but because I thought it was entertaining. Um, yeah, that's that something that I found what, that's on the, that sounds a really very violent look. It is, it, it is. Again, yeah. I mentioned that. I'll, I'll strike that from future presentations because maybe it's so, but yeah, well, I mentioned it because it's, it's interesting. However, um, I thought that was fascinating. And at the yeah. exploration part, is not violent. Yeah. That's yeah. the piece that if you we only allow your kids. I understand. To right. I understand. So to get back to the, uh, um, I, I don't allow it either for, the, just for sake of mm -hmm. illustration, I have 
you know, I mean, the Call of Duty stuff's also violent, but that has a context of the wars. And right. then my son and was You noticed that we didn't recommend any of those, though. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're not right. Right. at all. Then they, he got into history and talking right. to my, his yeah. father about right. the war, World War One. What, what is right. it like? What is it? You know, sure. That. I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. We could probably take that piece offline. Um, the the piece about, you know. My question was in the classroom, because mm -hmm. we're educators, right? Are schools offering different menus yeah. of games to engage the boys versus the to, girls? Because you can't offer Disney the boys. Well, Not okay. All the so boys. to be specific. Some of them won't uh, look yeah, at it. Yeah, no, they I get that. They want to see you know, um, Madden, they want to see whatever. So statistically you know? speaking, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of research into gender diversity inclusion in the gaming space yeah. oh, what is it is saying? not as it is not as spread as one might assume mm. um there are certain gaming spaces that are dominated by men however more than half of gamers in the world right now are women mm. in fact more gamers are adult women than there are teenaged boys no, True. I, I, I understand. I'm just getting there. Okay. I'm getting there. I'm working on it. So, mm -hmm. the in regards to the kinds of games that would be offered in a school setting, mm -hmm. there isn't a. a the, you're right. You, you can't necessarily offer a Disney game to a, you know to your average ten year old boy, right? Like that. I agree with you on that. However, the kinds in general, the kinds of games that are used in an educational setting, there isn't a variance across gender lines, like. With that said, you know your school better than I do. I'm just a talking head. Literally, I am a critic. So you know your school better than me. So if you are... They're not allowed much. They're not allowed much? Okay, she said they're not allowed much. Our district doesn't allow very much. Well, I, I mean, yeah. then... They barely show Netflix, so... <laughs> so, then, I mean, then, and, and with that said, then this is an interesting thought experiment and maybe not something that you have that you'll be able to apply practically and I apologize that for yeah. that but you know but it doesn't mean that it's going to be forever that the districts aren't going to look yeah. at this and right. you know or if the teachers get behind it and really want to bring it in they can yeah. sell the idea to the district right. Right. Okay. And it's going to probably be very yeah. narrow things too like Minecraft was around a while before it entered a classroom right and they had to do an educator mode Right. Nintendo Labo it's relatively new it's not as well known among the general population and, you know, it's really, it's known better in the gaming circles, but there was a new, um, they just had a publication that came out that was telling us how they're trying to get more open-ended things for classrooms. So here's something where here's the software, you can build something and then have interact with it digitally. And so that seems more classroom friendly. You're not dealing with inappropriate content. You're building a car and making it go across the table. Right. You're building a fishing pole and now you're gonna take and go fishing, quote unquote fishing. Those are classroom friendly content things. And gender neutral. And gender neutral, and gender neutral, neutral right. right. And go ahead. Uh, sorry. It's not about from the teacher and structure to differentiate between okay, boy and girl uh, according to their interest. So, you want the modern day answer? <laughs> In a classroom, Yes, we should be continually differentiating for interest, um, and and you know we're always going to craft the genre of our work, the genres of our work, and obviously want to motivate and engage learners, and we'll differentiate for their interest and, and ability um, and readiness alike. But are we specifically differentiating for gender? Typically not. Typically not, because most of the things you're bringing in your classrooms are gender neutral. So when Karen shared her experience, um, that was from a home environment. You know, that, that's a parent making a decision right. for, for her children. As educators, we're talking about something that we're pretty much exposing students to games that are, that are gender neutral. And that's really what's out on the market now, anyway, for gender neutral. Absolutely. Yeah, but some of these things in these slides are not gender neutral and they're not appropriate for content in sure, schools so or in families. Sure, so we're so making... So we're getting a presentation. I'm just trying to clarify yeah. this. So there's a distinction here. Today we're getting here. a clarification of the whole spectrum. You're giving us the whole spectrum. You got it. Yeah, oh, okay. yep. so we're seeing the family piece, but then we're also, as educators, trying to make some of those real-world connections because we, we can't only think about our students as students. We have to think about our students as children 
who are coming from a family context, right? So the nice thing about this presentation is it's giving us that family context, but then how can we then apply that where our children are coming from, right? A family, probably with different backgrounds and different parents and different, a different set of rules and different experiences, different exposures in their, in their own home life. And then how are we bringing that into our classroom and giving them those opportunities as, as digital natives to practice with that in a guided way in our classroom? So that's sort of a, a nice wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, um, and the last one, I think it's somewhat relevant, um, is you know remaining focused on the desired activity. We talked about it, right? Kids losing track because they're losing, or because they're bored, or they're so focused on the game that they forget about the other stuff that it's supposed to be being used to reinforce. And that is certainly a challenge with games, right? They are engaging, you get into it. I was practicing my math facts, but I was not really memorizing my math facts. I was really trying to get those ants to line up on the log or whatever, right? So <laughs> yeah. the, that is a challenge with games. Again, this, Linda said it a bunch of times, way more eloquently than I could. This is intended to be you know, a potential, you know, one tool in your toolbox, one option. It's not necessarily supposed to be the one sole thing that we rely on, um, depending on your curriculum. So, um, I think the video game piece is done. So now we can talk about some non-digital games. Um, and it does link back on a lot of these too. So, <laughs> so board games are definitely my specialty. I enjoy the digital piece to a degree, but I'm definitely more of a tabletop sit around and talk kind of person. So. In education, there's definitely some ways that we can tap into some of these games that are out there, whether it be through during class instruction. I actually use some of this during recess, and I have some little anecdotes I can uh, pepper into this discussion a little bit, just to see what I do within my own classroom with students. Um, so with some of these games, the cooperation element again, there's games that foster engineering skills, and I have uh, one to show you today, dexterity. So. I know it's not necessarily as pertinent for the older kids, but with the little kids, those fine motor skills, the gross motor skills. And you may still see kids that are older than me, because they need it. refinement, so it doesn't go away. We do have elementary folks in here. Right, just, right, yeah. I'm just trying to make sure I talk to all, because I'm so used yes. to talking down to the primary. Um, I gotta bring myself up to you know the high school level, too. Um, strategy, and as Steve was saying before, in gaming, you have to kind of think of where you're going and planning. So you see that in the digital, but also in the tabletop. Um, and you know, the coding, um, how to be a good winner and good loser. Sure. How to be nice yes. about it. I won, I'm not gonna be doing cartwheels and lying in your face. I lost, I'm disappointed but I'm okay. I'm not gonna be crying in the corner. So that's a big social piece. And then there's a lot of games out there with content area content in them. So let me just bring out, I brought just a few games from my personal collection. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> so I've only been really collecting for like two years, and this is only a fraction, like a tiny fraction of my collection. I've kind of, to say I've gone down the rabbit hole is an understatement. So, of course, he ran off to uh, powder his nose, and I don't know how to change the screen. Is it this the forward arrow? Uh, yep, yes, yep. Okay, yeah. the technology worked. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of educational themes, and I just wanted to throw these out there. Uh, I'm going to kind of go quick through this because I know this is a lesser focus. But I just wanted to give you some exposure to it. So, and this is a show and tell. This is my first grade teacher coming out, I'm sorry. So, I'm going to do a lot of show and tell with it because I have the physical things to show you. So, in um, the English and language arts, there's a ton of stuff out there that you can tie back in. So, one game that um, I'm actually writing a supplemental article to with more ideas um, Lurble is basically just picture cards. Um, so, this is something I took on my dining room table. And the core game you're just saying, another word that starts with the same letter, so it's real basic for little kids, but you can use this for story starters, here's a couple cards that do it. There's so many other ways you can apply this, even up to like middle school. You know, how do the, you know, how are these sets together? What are the same and different? You can really expand upon it. And what's cool with this one is there's an educational application booklet that's actually part of the game. And I read it, and the first time I saw it, I said, Steve, I can think of more. Can I write more? So I'm actually working on that as a little side project. Um, so that's one. I have seen Blurble used yes. with middle school English language arts students. You want to engage them and, well, engage them. 
engaged family game. There we go. Engagement is our core. They're uh, fascinated with this because they can feel like they're kids again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I also, play games also with my high schoolers and they they love it. I mean, if you can make a game out of anything to do with the content, you know, I think there's a time and place for it. But I also find the kids they will gravitate, at least the high schools will gravitate more towards a board game and something tangible than anything online. I think they spend so much time on the screen. Sure. And it has its appeal. Yeah. Um, so one thing in one of those things that I feel is I think put the boxing backwards. Um, and these are super inexpensive, so when you have no budget, like these are $10, 15 um, Rory Story Cubes, they literally mm -hmm. just pictures. There's a basic set, which is this one. And they are tons of little expansions. I have the enchantment expansion. There's a ton of these. They're super inexpensive. And the idea is you roll them and you make a story based on what you like. They work really well for writing prompts or yeah. drawing prompts. Um, yeah, right. That's yeah. what my kid's using for, for drawing. You know, my 10 year old loves to draw. So he'll just do right. roll some dice and be like, I'm going to draw an elephant in a restaurant having tacos. So, <laughs> so that was yesterday. Yeah. That was yesterday. Yeah. Um, you know, those kids, I don't know what to write. Well, here, roll these and make a story. There you go. No excuses. You know. And we've been talking about web quests as well and what that, uh, I know it sounds archaic, we've talked a lot <laughs> in class about the new web quest. Um, so when you have a particular task, your process, your your offline process could be something game-based. Mm -hmm. Right. Before you take it digital, you can do the analog piece. Um, so I put a link in here, and I'm not going to go to the site, but there is, there's a couple articles that have already been published through the Engage Family Gaming website, and there's one that's 12 awesome board games that teach reading and language arts. A lot of these are geared towards slightly younger children, but um, one that you guys I'm sure have heard of, Scrabble. And that's mm -hmm. one that you can use going up, that language building, the vocabulary. You can make content yeah. Scrabble, use your vocabulary words. Mm -hmm. um, the Nanograms is a similar flavor to Scrabble. I haven't played that one, so I don't know that one as. I mean, it's Scrabble on a board. You know, it comes in a cute cloth banana. And it's basically Scrabble on a board. You have to free form it. Um, but what's cool is you're making your own board, like your own letters, and you can, if you just, if you get run into a dead end, you can just split it all apart and start again. So maybe you, you're building your crossword puzzle and you reach a dead end and you figure out you can re-scramble the letters. You just go and it's a race. It's really hard. Maybe, maybe it's just because I'm dumb. I don't know. But it's really hard. It's, it's hard so thing. hard. You're not good with the board I play, building. I played against the designer at New York well, that's never a good idea. And they are really good <laughs> at the Nanograms. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yes. People who design their games are good at them. Uh, one game that I actually have my recess crate, so my kids play at recess, my students play at recess, is Zingo. And it's, oh. got this, it's super cute. It's got this little compartment, this plastic piece. You push it down, and a little tail pops out. And there's different ones. You can have sight words. You can have your, I'm trying to think, there's short vowels. Um, it's just matching matching uh, letters. I mean, they scale. There's a bunch of different ones. So for the little guys, for the young children, that one's super cute. And it's one of those, I have a basic one. So my first graders that are still five years old can go in and play this, and it's accessible to them. And they're getting a little practice with their language arts skills, even during indoor recess. So it's a little perk. Um, there's a bunch of other ones. Dix is another game that's on, at the, on the website. Um, it's got pictures and you're trying to give clues, so it's got a lot of that oral language piece and telling description, descriptive language. So there's a lot out there that it ties in. It may not be the primary objective of the game, but, you know, no recess is a thing. Danger is coming, as they say. And for anyone that has to deal with kids inside a recess, maybe these are the games that you see them on sale, you put it in the cupboard. Mm. And it's there, and it's reinforcing, and you don't even realize it. So that may be a way, at least with the board games, to fit some of these in. Um, there's also the math games. So I have to show you in a jump to one. I found out about this game fairly recently. So it's called Sky Joe, and all it is is you're trying to get the lowest score. So it's supposed to be for eight and up. My six-year-old played this pretty successfully, and there's negative numbers. It's only negative one and negative two. It's negative two up to 12. And he understands it. And he can, oh, it's negative, so I take away two. So it's one of these math skills. And I mean, it's a really basic game. Again, I have a six-year-old playing it. But it's fun, it's engaging, and you're you know, strategizing, well, if I flip this card, am I going to get, you know, am I taking a chance it's going to be a higher card? So it's that strategy. And it is competitive, but it's getting the conversation. 
So because these six, again, we're talking, well, what do you think? You know this number, this might be higher, you know, do you want to take a chance? So this, you know, teaching them that problem solving. Um, one game that is super popular for my boys right now is Roll For It. It's a little itty bitty box. It's got different colored dice, and you're just trying to ma match sets of dice. Super easy. They keep pulling this out when their friends come over. This is on my short list to have for indoor recess because it's, it's not, there's no reading. It's, if you can read numbers, you can play this. Um, and I'm going to talk about them shortly, but there's also apps for some of these. Some of these board games, there's actually quite a collection of, uh, of board games in app form. So, um, and this is the one I have the anecdote about, Too Many Monkeys. Um, this one is another math-based game. You're trying to build one to six. Whoever gets that, the next round you have to build one to five, one to four, one to three. So you're trying to have just one monkey to build. There are skip cards. My class had a really great life lesson on don't dish it if you can't take it. Because I had a little boy who gleefully was skipping his friends during indoor recess and he was you know, playing appropriately, playing it correctly, and then lost his mind when somebody skipped him. So we had a little powwow, we had a little life lesson on, <laughs> listen, if this upsets you, maybe you shouldn't play this game. You know, because that, they played it correctly, they did what you did. So we had a little life lesson, and that was valuable teaching, incidental teaching on it. But there's another skill. Again, in your recess, we had a whole little lesson on playing fair, being a good winner, being a good loser. It's okay to get a skip card. All right. Um, and again, there's another article with more games that Gosh, might be. Could I ask? I would have brought that to you. Okay. Um, so I have a science teacher back there. This is my current favorite game right now: photosynthesis. It is all about the tree life cycle in a gorgeous board game. Is this boy? This is my favorite game. So it's you know, it, in, it's not a real complicated game. It's beautiful. I just, the photograph I put up there is the table when we were playing. Like you got three D trees. Just it's engaging and it's talking about what the tree needs resources. So it's one of those if it ties into your science. You know, again, this isn't a little game that you may just pull off the shelf, but it's another resource out there. If you end up getting a copy from something, it may be something that can be useful. Um, so my boys currently love a very silly card game from Scholastic. Have you guys heard of the Who Would Win books? Where the two animals are pitted against each other and they give you the statistics. It's a, they're nonfiction books. Um, they're probably about a third, fourth grade reading level. My kids love them. Scholastic, being smart and trying to market their books, made a card game with all just animal statistics. It's basic. It's three, like weight, length, and speed. And it's basically like war. You name an attribute. Flip a card, whoever has a higher value gets the cards. Very, very basic. I love it. They're learning facts. They're learning all these features about animals in this little itty bitty card game. And I got it for like $3 through Scholastic Points or something. So it's one of those, you can throw that in there and it's another way to do it. Um, Genius Games, I just wanted to share them because these guys are amazing. Where did the mouse end up? The mouse is this. I'm not as tech savvy. There we go. So this, I'm just going to quickly show you this. Hmm? I, I didn't even think to click the link. Yeah, I'm trying to go quick because I don't want to hold. These guys want to go home. Oh. All right, can I scroll down? Let's see. Can work? Ah, there we go. Kind of. Okay. Ah. Is there a way to scroll? Oh, there we go. I just have to pick up the technology. It's a weird, weird keyboard. It is, a, it is unusual. So for science, this group. I believe the it's creator one dude. was it's one he's, guy. he's a science teacher. And so he started making these games of different science ideas to help teach his students. So I mean just things that are out there that you would never even think. Um, he just recently I think Cytosis, no, I'm sorry, Subatomic is his most recent one. Cytosis was the one that came out last year. Um, Mom, yeah, I mean, who would think that you would go and you know, so if you know, like, you teach about subatomic particles, there's a game that actually is scientifically accurate. I mean, the things that are out there are absolutely incredible. And I've interviewed him. He's a real smart guy. Yeah. He knows the stuff. There's, I just would like to make a comment. In or, preparation for today's class, I found online, just like the cards, like the ELA cards, there's uh, element cards, and it's a flash deck of 
hydrogen, water, uh, oxygen, and all that. You pass out the cards, and then the kids have to make a compound like water and H2O. And they get the element. Yeah, it's, it's like playing cards. It's playing cards. Fantastic. So yeah. I thought, okay, crap. I buy those things <laughs> in my class when I yeah. next year. Or, I to teach. Or make them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you have no, no budget. You can make them. Had, like, oh, are, they, are they cool? It had like, the oh, top yeah. and all that. So while the kids oh, yeah. are, they, yeah. they just get the stuff by osmosis by looking at it. You know, it, it's like playing this. All that stuff is positive reinforcement. For right. Yeah. Anything. I mean, so that's all educational psychology. Oh, yeah. And, and it's all the pleasure center. It is. I mean, I have one from the States of America. It's all Geography. osmosis. They're just going to get it while right. they're getting the You're absolutely. And all that. Yeah. That's the thing. And that's trying to insert these in that, you know, right. reinforcement. These aren't our instructions. This is not our primary instruction. Right. We're not advocating this is how you're going to teach your concepts. No, this is the reinforcement. This yeah, is the, the NGSS, engagement. Yeah, but I do have a comment. Right the NGSS lesson plans are, are all changed now. A year ago, they're all project based. They came mm -hmm. from Harvard, yeah. and yeah. you have to have this stuff in lesson plans. Yeah. This yeah. is a requirement. What is the scrambled space? So, so it could be ten minutes. Okay, yeah. we're going to have a ten minute class activity. Right, right. And you let them do the activity. Right. Right. So scrambled states of America is actually a book, and Dean Wright took that, and they have actually two games. This is one of them. This is a smaller one. I want to try to lighten my bag a little, and it's a, a geography game about features of the states. So it's similar to the who would win, it's you know, trying to get the certain feature, you know, what attribute does it have that matches the set and you know, but it's learning attributes about the states. So it's got that geography tie in. Um, so there's just there's a lot out there that you can can tie in. Again, you know, this was one I found on sale, you know, probably ten dollars. I try to hit get the games and get a deal. You know, smart shopping. It's like we do for all of our classroom things. We try to hit the sales, get a good deal. Um, and I mentioned before, I, just, I said about a music game. So this is one that uh, we actually got as a review copy. And it, you literally are composing. So you, this does have a technology link. You have to have the technology for this. So you log into their website. You put up a series of cards. And literally, it stacks its bars of music. And you can orient them different ways. They are clear on purpose so that you can change how they orient. I'm going to find Dr. Mama Brown. There we go. I mean, such a nice simple, it's a deck of music, basically. And you lay it out, and depending on how you orient it, there's numbers, depending on how you hold it. And you enter these numbers into their website, it will play your music. Yeah, I heard that from my brother. You've seen it? It's amazing. And so how this is how do you use that again? That should get so my niece and nephew. It's so cool. The ones that just so go. you lay out four where of these where cards. Where do these go? I just want to know where they go. What do you, you mean? Computer? So you have to yeah. What do you do with the cards? Okay. So what you would do, like yeah, if I wanted to compose a song, I would lay out four, a row yeah. four at a time. Because that's how you end up with the computer. So you go to their website, it's free. You just yeah. buy the game, and it's not that expensive. And so if I wanted these four, and I want them oriented that way. Yeah. There's a four-digit code in the upper corner. You enter that into this mm -hmm. program. And it will play it as you lay it out. Oh, I don't like this. I'm going to flip this one over and play oh, it that oh, way. Oh, I see. And you can it's manipulate it. And oh. yeah, oh, it's, it's really cool. cool. It's in order to compose. Oh, that's so cool. yeah, that is really really cool. Um, so for anyone that's musically inclined, like this is <laughs> what's that called again? It's called Compose Yourself, and it is actually on the slide, the bottom one. Think Fun publishes this. They do a lot that crosses the education into the education realm. They have they publish Zingo. They have this one. Um, a lot of puzzles. A lot, lot of, of, lot like of single games. player. Um, so I get it for one. What's uh, the website? Are we getting these slides? Um, uh, you may have we, these slides. Yeah. We, we, can can these slides. we can figure out a way to share this if we want. Have we get the links and things like a view only? View only, yes. Yeah, we can definitely do this, you know. Mm. Sure. I didn't know. I didn't sure. know a couple of yeah. That's okay. Yeah. No, we yeah. that was going to be We were discussing that earlier, like, because we did put links in there. And there's just not enough yeah. time to show you guys every single thing. Right. I know. So we have the name of something. And I put a link in there. That's yeah. awesome. Um, so mm -hmm. I didn't bring it because it's big and awkward, but my boys have, I think, four or five different things on their single player games. They're more like a puzzle. There's one, my, my son's most recent one. It's a group building roller coaster. It gives you start here, you must use these pieces, and get to here. And it's all, that's engineering. That's STEM right there. Mm -hmm. And it is single player, but the challenges get more rigorous. And they have a bunch of games it's like strategy. this. It's, it's all really strategy. Great. 
It will bring tons of that. They have a laser maze one where you're trying to literally use mirrors to reflect a laser beam to hit a target and light up a little thing. Um, there's, um, um, that one's really hard. That was hard. That was hard. Laser maze is tough. We have the junior version, and even the junior version is slightly easier. It's still tough. I'm not very good at it. Um, there's a marble one where you're trying to build paths to get the marble from point A to point B. So it's all that engineering and the flexible thinking. Many of them have more than one solution. So, I mean, they're really great for that kind of thing. Um, that. Um, so I just wanted to throw this out there at the types of games. I had no idea about this before I got into writing about games. But there's many kinds, and this is not even a complete list. I tried to go with the ones you're most likely to encounter in games that will help you with your students. Um, so one game, and I have two more similar booths at my house. Um, this is, again, think fun. Um, this is a program motion game. You literally are doing coding, but with, on, on the table. So you have to program how you're gonna get your character from point A to point B, and there might be obstacles, and. So there's this one out. Um, I recently got a copy of a game called um, Coder Bunnies, which is very similar to this. They have some different features of the coding. Um, and so they're, they're out there. So if you have kids that are interested in coding, this might be more cost effective than some other means too, because now you're spending $30 and you have it. And you can use it again and again. And they scale up. Um, what's really cool with these is there's a pamphlet basically, and it tells you like, this is for four and up. Well, for the four year olds, you're gonna wanna go with the most basic thing. But it gets into, you know, you can add all these layers, and so it's not for four year olds anymore. It's gonna be for the 10 year olds, because it's the same game, but it's got way more complexity. So this is something pretty neat that's out there that not everyone knows about, these resources. And then you could start with the, you know, doing it on the table, and then maybe go to something digitally you get familiar with the idea, the premise of coding, and then I know there's a bunch of stuff online where you can do different coding. So you can see it in different formats, too. Um, cooperative. So these are some just really well-known ones, at least among people that are into gaming. And that has been out for a little while now. Before I even started writing um, about games, my niece found out about this. And this is the Save the World. There's an epidemic, you're trying to find a solution before the epidemic takes over. And it's cooperative. You either all win or you all lose. We lose more often than we win at this game, but that's okay. <laughs> you also learn how to lose together. Um, same idea, um, game rights, and we love game rights stuff. They make it great family-friendly games. Um, this is the first of a series of three games. They're survival, so on this one you're getting off the same king island. Same thing, you've got to all get to the helicopter and make it before the island sinks or you all don't make it. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that are giving that collaboration. And that may be, maybe that's an after school club thing. If there's a board game club. My kid's school has for third, fourth, and fifth, one day a week, uh, one day a month after school, they have a board game one. Now most of their stuff is the same stuff we grew up with, the basics. But if you, you know, get one copy of that to them, they can learn every different, different life. Is a little bit different, I think. Fantastic. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. I know a lot of that. Yeah, every district is different, and almost like that has changed. Yeah. All right, well, a lot of it has changed as a whole. So, I mean, there's more. I wanted to show this one, though, because this has been. Saw that online. Yes. This is one that is like a gateway game for a lot of people. Because it is, it is, it is. Trust me, this That's is. That's actually a term. It's a term because it's sure. getting you into more complicated things, and you know, not in a negative sense. What is it? So this, this is, um, so this is called Ticket to Ride. This game is you're basically buying railroad pieces and you're trying to build your track from point A to point B. Oh. Not real complicated. Oh, with the map. Yeah, and yeah. that's the cool thing. This has so the original game has the U.S. just the continental U.S. Mm -hmm. They have Europe. They, there's, I mean, how many, there's oh, like, I there's like, like 10 done. maps. I mean, they, they have yeah. India, the heart of Africa, mm -hmm. Norway. Oh, there's wow. a bunch. And, 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 you know, Great Britain, Europe. I mean, they have a bunch of different maps. Right. Yeah. That all follow basically the same rules. The difference is you're learning different cities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we play Europe yeah, with my kids, and they're Barcelona learning yeah. how to get exactly. from Barcelona to Prague. They don't know they're learning something. Well, that's the thing. This is familiarity. So maybe, again, you happen to have this sitting on your shelf at home, right. and you bring it out. And 
they might get familiar with an area that they're not. There's cities on this map, I'm like, oh, that's where that is. Right. You know, like these little incidental things, but it's like, and it's accurate. They try to make these actually geographically accurate, so it is giving you that information. Um, so, and with the engineering, I talked about the Think Fun. The only other one I really wanted to show that I brought, I didn't bring evolution at the beginning because that one's a little heavier. Um, that's my 10 year old's one of his favorites right now. Um, where you're basically building species. So, we get science. So, this is tile laying, too. There's a lot of games out there where you're laying down tiles as part of building your, getting to your objectives. And it depends on the game with the objective. This one, you're trying not to fall off the world. Basically, <laughs> so there's a lot out there. So I got a little rambly. I could talk about these forever, and I'm trying to be very conscious of your time. Oh no, we're um, this. So we're right, we're right near the end. Um, but this is where it links back, back to the digital parts. I know this is more your primary focus, and this is the last of me like trying to just convey all my nerddom towards you. You know what? Um, that's so funny that you say that, Linda, because you know. So uh, often times when I'm teaching technology courses and we're talking about 21st century skills and we talked about it a, a lot this semester um, in, in all of our technology courses, folks think that uh, technology is, is just online and folks might think that those 21st century skills is just the integration of computer technology into the classroom. And, and we talk about really this <laughs> Is breeding technology because any 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 application that students have for that problem solving and collaboration and creativity, um, yes, our focus may, maybe is more digital. But when we talk about technology and education, this is real world stuff. So we love seeing both. I, I can speak for us all, right? When I say we like to see um, <coughs> the hands on on stuff too, and we know how critical hands on with the kids. It's you got so it. critical. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I showed you roll for it before. This is on my phone too. So this one, it makes the exact same game, but instead of rolling the dice, you shake the phone, it rolls the dice for you, and then you drag and place them to bid on the card. And it's the same game, but it gives it a digital means. Um, ticket to ride. I have this on my phone too. We may have been having to wait for an appointment, and my kids go, can we play ticket to ride? Here you go. And it literally has a play and pass. Child A plays their move, they hand the phone to child B, child B plays their move, they hand it back. They're still playing the game. It's the same exact game, it's just in a digital format. So they're still getting all those benefits, but I don't have to carry that box with me. I can pull my phone out at the doctor's office in the waiting room, and now they are engaged in a game where they are using all these great skills, and I don't need all these pieces. They're not gonna drop everything on the floor. Um, Splendor's another one that's on my phone. I didn't bring that one. Um, that's where you're trying to collect gems. Again, so set collection, it's planning, I want to get to this many points. Um, I don't have this one, but I know Steve's wife loves patchwork. Um, I haven't played patchwork, that's... It's that plan I mean, that was planning? more about like planning. It's yeah. really, you have a, the idea is you're trying to build a quilt, and there are, um, huh. you know, out of these cardboard pieces, and you have a, a wheel in front of you of different shapes, and it's a two-player game, um, so it's, uh, you know what you need and you have to plan for what you're trying to get knowing that your opponent has their own needs and also knows what you need at the same time. So it's a piece of, a bit of, you have to plan ahead, you know, three or four, you know, sometimes even more moves. Um, it really makes you think. Um, and the next thing with the online mode is you can play against the computer. So you don't have to have a friend to hand it to. You can just play and then the computer plays your opponent. So, you know, you're sitting waiting for... You know, I like the doctor's appointment because you clearly, I clearly do that a lot with the children. Um, but you know, there's a lot of times we have we have some downtime. It's at least something engaging instead of just scrolling through Facebook or having the kids just you know running them up or on something that's completely mindless. This at least they have to do some strategy and some thinking. Um, the last one I listed is Labyrinth. It's a maze game where you're trying to get to certain objects on the maze, but the maze keeps moving. So it's a lot of so you can only plan you know it's planning, but then your plans are thwarted. So a lot of flexible thinking in that. And that tabletop game's a lot of fun too. But those are just a small smattering. That's not even all the games I have on my phone. Do you guys know if there's any games that teach foreign languages like Spanish or French? I don't know any personally, but I would be shocked if there wasn't something out there. I would no, I just wonder. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, we, have a, we have a language expert here. No, I found it. Spanish or French. I what did you find? Um, English bilingual. Um, Scrabble in Spanish. Oh, Scrabble, okay. Yeah, Brainbox. 
in Spanish, Spanish too. In Clu, P L O O. So, because I mean, I, I, so race to Madrid. Oh, play the game and speak Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the board game industry, Thanks. just in general, has had like a double digit growth for the past like six or seven years. So it's literally um, having been to like New York Toy Fair and other things and seeing like prototypes and stuff. If you can imagine a subject or a topic, there is a board game out there about it. So or like learning you know. learning a language, every language you can imagine. I have not played them, but I am certain that there are, I mean, you found three in just a little bit of research. Sure, if we dug a little bit more, we could find it for just about anything. Um, and if there isn't, um, and this is something that I talk about a lot with you know my kids or you know when I'm doing talks at libraries, at the end of the day, the advantage to a board game is it's just a box of stuff. You know, we talk about Scrabble in Spanish, right? Like the idea that, you know, at the end of the day, letters are pretty similar with some exceptions. You can make some adjustments and boom, a regular $5 Scrabble game is Scrabble in Spanish. You can just do what you need to do. A lot of these games are just a box of stuff and you can adjust it and do whatever you need to do. Um, and you can use it to reinforce whatever you need. I mean, some of that's creativity. You guys are obviously here for a reason. So, you know, those are just resources. But and sometimes you, you need to build social skills inside a classroom mm -hmm. that doesn't relate it with a content area you can use in English mm -hmm. too. Because right. some sure. like, that is the, the first language is in English. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing too. I mean, even if it doesn't link exactly to your content, if you're building that community, mm -hmm. if you're building a social interaction mm -hmm. skill, that's huge. Sometimes that's more important than our content. Yes, they need mm -hmm. to work together in in order to, right? in order to they to do. to do the, the task inside exactly. inside the classroom. Exactly. Yeah. I also remember in sixth grade social studies, we had to make our own board games. Mm -hmm. and it was the most fun <laughs> I ever had, and it was really awesome. And we all played each other's games mm -hmm. when we all did it. So I mean, something like that. I wish I was in that social studies class. I know. It was I really so would. fun. Although I'm really bad at making games, that's why I critique them. Making <laughs> <laughs> games is hard. Yes. A lot of work. All right, so the last thing we've got is just how to get in touch with us. So if this interests you, you want to learn more, you have questions for us, I mean, we wear different hats. You know, this is not our full time job. I'm a classroom teacher, it's my full time job. Steve is in. I work in health insurance. Don't get mad at me. Really mad. <laughs> I mean, but. <laughs> You know, this is something we've educated ourselves on and we, and we enjoy it. And so if we can be a resource to you, we're more than happy to uh, to be there for you. All right? Yeah. So. Um, I create content constantly. So the different way, you know, so the easiest way to reach me um, would be, you know, we have a Facebook page. So you can look it up, Engage Family Gaming, and you can send us a private message. Um, I have a community manager um, who's a volunteer who helps me out, but I see everything. So if you have a question, or if you want to yell at me about something, totally cool, <laughs> throw a message in there, I will respond within, uh, I think it's within like five hours, um, is how quickly I respond. And I try and, you know, I can get you links, I can help you find games if you need them, um, and I'll totally be fine if you want to just yell at me, I'm totally cool with that, I get a lot of that too. <laughs> um, we also have podcasts, um, so if you're a podcast person, um, you know, we have two um, one of them is, it's called Engage, a family gaming podcast. It comes out every week. We alternate between video games and board games. You can subscribe and choose what you want. And board games, it's me and Linda talking most of the time. Otherwise, I try and get guests and we talk about some interesting stuff. The other, the other one is relatively new. Um, it's literally me talking about various gaming topics while I drive to work. Legally, I put, it, I put my phone in my dashboard. So many people are worried that I'm doing videos. I promise you, I'm not videotaping myself while I'm driving. That's super illegal. Um, but you can also, you know, we're on Twitter and we're also on Instagram. So if you want to see some pictures of the, the stuff that we do, you can find us all there. And these will all be on your slides that we are going to provide to you through your professor so you can do as you like. What questions do you have for us, if any? I know we, we had some dialogue during the class, but. I have a question. Sure. Uh, my question is about Raspberry Pi device. Do you know it? I'm sorry? About? Res uh, rasp uh, raspberry Pi device. Oh, the Raspberry Pi? Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you handle that one. Do you use gaming tool? As a gaming tool? So, 
Well, for those of you that don't necessarily know what it is, a Raspberry Pi, outside of being something very delicious, um, it's also a computer. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, a very inexpensive, homegrown PC that you can build. You can buy the parts, and you build this little computer and put it in a box. And it can be used to play games on. Um, uh, so making it is super easy and great. I've done it with my kids. Um, I have a friend of mine that actually will build Raspberry Pis inside old NES cartridges, and that's like his thing he does. Um, the problem with that is software. Um, you are not legally allowed to have uh, a copy of a video game that you, do, that you are not backing up, right? So like, if you wanted to have this, the original Super Mario Brothers on a Raspberry Pi, you legally are not allowed to own that unless you're using it as a backup of your disc. So they are of questionable legality um, and whatnot. So I typically don't recommend using Raspberry Pi. We can't create games by... Uh, yeah, get into that. Most common use, you Google Raspberry Pi, they're going to tell you how to build a Nintendo with a billion games on it. But absolutely, the Raspberry Pi, I mean, you can get one for, I think, like 40 bucks right now. Yeah, I mean, they're super cheap. Um, and you can, it, there are suites of software you can put on there, and they are great tools for creating your own software, your own games. Um, so those are awesome tools, um, and they're very inexpensive. Um, I just... Like, again, just don't Google Raspberry Pi gaming because you'll just end up stealing stuff from the internet. Um, but I totally support building them because it's, it's not very often you get to get a kid to build a computer. I mean, you can, but you, know, you think of building a computer, you think these big $1,000 rigs. A, a Raspberry Pi is a $40 piece of technology and it's the size of a cigarette box. It's this little thing, and, and they can they, they build the whole thing and set it up and plug it into a monitor, and they get to use it. It's so fascinating, um, and they're only getting cooler. It, you may I, I don't think you've seen them, but I've seen. They're super cool. One of our friends in the community. I only know about them because of what I've read in the community. It's good to know things. Yeah. yeah. It's not really pertinent now. Right. Exactly. So I, I'm familiar, roughly familiar. I have one, That's and I do enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think it's yeah. uh, I understand it's it's alternative uh, for uh, Nintendo. Uh -huh. Because Nintendo Labs maybe with the kit is uh, cost for the the three and uh, three hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, it is expensive. For You're right. For forty dollars, you can coding and you can use it. Uh, Agreed. Street, uh, no, I agree. The Raspberry Pi is a really cool tech option, and I know that they they do dis they do educational stuff. I mean, that company is deliver they're trying to democratize PC access. So you know, if they know that they're sending product to a school, I bet they do something. Um, I don't work with them regularly, but I'm sure they would do something to try and make it easier. That's what they want. They want everybody to have a PC. They want everybody to have multiple PCs. So, what other questions? Any? I think you guys are, you guys are done with me. <laughs> I We're have gonna... three questions, but you answered all of them. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah. you've had such a comprehensive presentation, I'm pretty sure a lot of the questions were answered right during your talk. Fair enough. All right. But, please. Just yeah. send us a message. Well, I'm always happy to be a resource. I love talking about this stuff. Um, and and guys, we'll make sure you guys get the slides. Yeah. I don't know. And to make it completely clear, these folks came to us um, tonight on their own time. As you know, they have their own their own families, their own children. Um, I got out of doing dishes, so I'm yeah. super so, cool. Um, yeah. So we really appreciate you coming and, and all of the insights and ideas you shared with us. We'll be certain to check in. Um, we appreciate you sharing the slides. Um, if we can take a couple of minutes for them to sort of dig into some yeah, and maybe ask in a more intimate yeah. forum, um, let's give them yeah. a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week.